Hello, I'm Jack Grady, and today is June the 27th, 2012, a little more than 70 years since the beginning of World War II. And on behalf of the Archives and History Committee of the First Baptist Church on the Square in LaGrange, Georgia, for the past four months, I've been involved in the process of identifying and then interviewing uh, church members who were in the military service during World War II. It's been a most interesting experience, and I am grateful for the privilege and indeed the honor to be a part of this experience. As I mentioned, we've uh, attempted to identify all of our church members who served during World War II in the military. Uh, we identified 40. Regrettably, 20 of them, half of them, are now deceased. But of the remaining number of men and women, nine of them were in the U.S. Army, five were in the U.S. Navy, Two were in the Army Air Corps, now known as, of course, the United States Air Force. Now, there were two who served in the Marine Corps. One was in the Women's Army Corps. And interestingly, one gentleman served in the Navy, the Army, the Air Corps, and in counterintelligence. Well, Chairperson Julia Dyer, who heads up our Archives and History Committee, has asked me to tell my story of my experience during World War II. And I will endeavor to do that now. On December the 7th, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. I was 14 years of age. I had an older brother who had graduated from college. And while he was in college, working his way through school, I might add, he was a part of the ROTC. When he graduated, he went ahead and took his commission because of his ROTC experience and became a second lieutenant. He went on to serve in all the way through World War II, and not only that, but in the Korean War and the Vietnam War. He made a career in the Army, served as a distinguished Army officer for 32 years. I make that, uh, I make that statement to make this point. I was focused on essentially three things while I was in high school. Uh, one was, of course, uh, making good grades. I wanted to graduate. Another was playing football because I wanted to complete my uh, experience as a football player there. But the third uh, interest that I had was World War II. I was pretty well focused on all that was going on. Well, <clears throat> When I was a senior in high school, during my senior year, there were five of us, friends, classmates, who went down to visit the Naval Recruiting Officer almost every week. We couldn't wait to get into the Navy. We were eager to do so. We were ready. Uh, a, a little bit before time of graduation, we went to Birmingham, Alabama. We went through the enlistment process, our physical, examinations, and then we came back home in time to go through the graduation uh, process, the, all of the activities associated with that. And as soon as we finished doing that, we went back to Birmingham, where we were gathered together with a total of about 40 young men from around the state of Alabama. We boarded a train and went to the Great Lakes Naval Training Center on Lake Michigan. After we finished our basic training, which is called in the Navy boot camp, 
After we successfully finished boot camp, we boarded a train and headed for the West Coast. Uh, we ended up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and soon we were assigned our ship. Uh, interestingly for me, uh, happily for me, one of my classmates, a good close friend, uh, went with me. He had the same assignment that I did. We boarded the APA 173 named Herald of the Morning. That was our ship. We were on an attack transport ship. This ship was involved in some invasions, some of the islands in the South Pacific before we went aboard, uh, but it was an attack ship. We were prepared to take the troops into the, as close as we could to the shore, and they, of course, uh, launched uh, boats from our ship that took them right on into the shore. And that's where many, how many of the invasions took place. Ships like ours were a very part, very important part of that experience. Well, anyway, about one of my most memorable experiences, my Navy time, was leaving uh, the San Francisco Bay Area that first time. We uh, we left uh, our uh, docking area and we headed out to the South Pacific under the Golden Gate Bridge in late afternoon. And it was, a, it was an interesting, strange, scary kind of a time for us. The war, we knew that a lot of change was taking place. The war had just ended, but there was a lot of uncertainty out there in the South Pacific, and we didn't quite know what to expect. Uh, soon, we were in Japan. We made three trips to Japan and one trip to the Philippine Islands uh, during my time aboard that ship. Uh, the first trip to Japan, j just a short time after uh, the Japanese had surrendered, we went into Yokohama. The most interesting thing, I suppose, at least the most memorable experience, was uh, anchoring out there off uh, Yokohama and all of a sudden looking out around our ship. We were practically surrounded by Japanese. These were civilians. They, they were on little fishing boats, uh, little houseboats, but they gathered around our ship. And it was a kind of a scary time in a way. Uh, we really weren't uh, uh, fearful but it was just unexpected and we didn't quite know uh, why they were there. That soon we, we began to get the message that they wanted us to throw over candy bars and chewing gum and that sort of thing. But they were curious and wondering about us Americans and of course we were curious and wondering about these Japanese people. Here we were coming into their, their port uh, just right after the end of World War II. Well, we made uh, two other trips to Japan, uh, and we went into Tokyo Bay. The first trip into Tokyo Bay uh, was a learning experience for us. Uh, we would anchored out off of uh, Tokyo, and we, had, we were told that we could go ashore, uh, but the only thing we could do once we got ashore was to visit the USO. We could not go anywhere else. Again, this was right after the war ended. Tokyo had just been bombed to the, to the ground. Uh, our Air, Air Force had continuously bombed that city for a long period of time before the Japanese surrendered. So it was a vast area of devastation. We were told, go only to the USO. When we came back aboard ship, came back on the little motor launch, uh, up the ladder to our ship, saluted the US flag on our ship. We saluted the officer of the deck standing there as we aborted. And he told us, go immediately, shower, change your clothing. The bay is polluted. Another example of what was going on there in Tokyo. Well, we made one other, one other trip 
and that was to the Philippines, as I mentioned. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. I'd like to mention the responsibility that I had while I was on board ship, a grand learning experience for me. At first, like all young sailors, just out of boot camp, I went aboard as a seaman, second class, and then soon became a seaman first class. But we had responsibilities on the deck of the ship. We stood watch and that sort of thing. But I decided pretty soon that I wanted to, I wanted to aspire, work toward a rating that appealed to me. In the Navy at that time, the rating of quartermaster was unlike that in the Army. A quartermaster in the Army usually was in charge of supplies and that sort of thing. In the Navy, the quartermaster worked closely with the ship's navigator up in the pilot house, which was the nerve center of the ship. Well, uh, for about, I, it took me a while of personal study, encouragement from some of the ship's officers even, but it took me about two months to complete all of my preparations for that. I took the test and passed the test and I became a quartermaster on that ship and began serving my watches and the other things in the pilot house. Uh, there were three other uh, sailors who were also quartermasters at that time and we rotated our responsibilities. We had four hours on watch, eight hours off, but with a fourth man we could rotate so that we were not on the midnight watch every night. So we had different uh, times to do that. Well, uh, the responsibilities, as I said, were working with the navigator, but also when we were on duty, on watch in the pilot house, the quartermaster had the responsibility for keeping the ship's log. And that was a rather interesting experience. Every hour on the hour, uh, we would go out on the bridge of the ship and we would check some weather instruments like the anemometer, which registered the speed of the wind. We looked at the sky to see what kind of clouds there were. We looked at the sea to see what kind of sea uh, there was and what direction it was, was flowing. All of these things had to be recorded in the ship's log. Uh, it was a rather interesting experience and I learned a lot as a 18 year old. I was 18 by that time. Well, uh, the other thing that I was required to do when I was on watch, and it was the only thing I didn't like, I, in the night particularly, if there was anything that was uh, unusual or perhaps uh, some radar uh, image that had been picked up by our ship, perhaps a uh, a ship, we did have this experience one time, uh, a ship that miles away, but if, it had, if they had continued on their course and we had continued on our course, it would have been a collision course. I had to go down and wake up the captain and tell him this. And he came up immediately as he always did. Sometimes he would look at me when it didn't seem to be particularly significant uh, he would look at me as though, why are you waking me? Take care of it. But anyway, he never did that. He came up and he took care of it, talked to the officer of the deck, and they did whatever they did, whatever they had to do. One other thing I wanted to mention about our experience on our ship. Uh, again, uh, re recall this is just right after the end of World War II. We had to contend with floating mines. Floating mines were in the water. We assumed that uh, these mines had been released by the Japanese near the end of World War II. But they were, there were a lot of them floating about in the Pacific. And we were on constant watch for these mines. And when one was sighted, the officer of the deck would, would uh, immediately call out for a couple of marksmen that we had aboard our ship. And they would come out with their rifles and they would fire away at these floating mines and explode them before we got close to the mines. One time, we came within just a few feet of hitting one of those mines. 
they just couldn't seem to explode that mine with their rifle. And the, the wake of the ship, as the ship moves through the water rapidly, it pushes the water away, of course, and that's called a wake. And the wake of the ship at the last minute seemed to just push that floating mine away just enough for our ship to pass right on by it. And then, as I recall, it's been a long time, but the marksman finally did uh, detonate that floating mine. Uh, one other thing I'd like to, to mention about that period of time, uh, as I said at the outset, we didn't quite know what to expect. Uh, soon after we went uh, aboard ship and we got into the South Pacific, uh, we received a message, two messages on the same day, August 15th, 1945, official message intended to ships for tip, ships at sea. The first message is this, very brief. Orders have been issued to the U.S. Pacific Fleet and to other forces under the command of the Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Pacific Fleet, and Pacific Ocean areas to cease offensive operations against the Japanese. And then six hours later, this message was received. One, the government has announced that the Japanese have surrendered. Two, all offensive operations are here, therefore to cease forthwith. Three, some time may elapse before the actual instrument of surrender is signed and before it is clear that Japanese forces have received and intend to carry out the instructions of their high command. Accordingly, danger of attack by individual surface craft, U-boats, and aircraft may persist for some time to come. This was a priority uh, announcement, a bulletin that came to us during that period of time. Uh, we had uh, general quarters frequently on the ship, which meant that uh, everybody had an assignment. Uh, there was a certain area that you had to go to, either to man a gun or do whatever you, whatever you were uh, needed to do to ensure that uh, we were prepared for whatever came along, whatever the eventuality might be. Well, yes, the war was over, but we were still on the alert. And as I said, we, we sounded general quarters frequently just to be sure that we stayed on alert. Well, <clears throat> I mentioned uh, my ship's captain. I got well acquainted with him. He would come up on the bridge often during the day when I was on watch, and he would just pace back and forth. Uh, he was, you could say he was a loner if you didn't know him, but I got to know him pretty well, and I appreciated him and his attitude and his service to his men. Uh, when we were in port back in Bremerton, Washington, that was our home port, Puget Sound, uh, when we were in port there, it was not unusual for him to order up from the motor pool there in, in our port, order up a, a car, a vehicle. And when the vehicle arrived, he would ask me to serve as his driver. And of course, that was fun for me, an 18-year-old driving the skipper of our ship around in the port area of Bremerton, Washington. Well, that was one of those growth experiences as well. Uh, I mentioned the trip to the Philippines. That was a long trip. We didn't even leave our ship for 40 days. It was about a 20-day trip over there, and we expected to go into Manila. Well, one day out of Manila, we got a change of orders. Uh, I was uh, one of the few who knew about that, but I, even I didn't know why we got the change of orders. Uh, only the captain and the officer of X uh, knew what was going on. But we went around and said to Subic Bay, and we anchored off the, out in the bay there at Subic Bay, we took on some military personnel. I think, as I recall, they were naval personnel who had been there for some time. 
uh, we took on some supplies, and then the next day we hoisted anchor and we headed back to the United States. Interestingly, and one of the most memorable things about that trip was the typhoon. It was the only time I was ever in a typhoon, and once was enough. We altered our course a little bit. We took a more northerly route back to uh, Bremerton uh, than we had first intended, uh, but the storm was fierce. And our ship, of course, normally when you're at sea, you do a lot of pitching. The ship would pitch and roll both. But we were doing an awful lot of rolling. And uh, I was on, on watch in the pilot house uh, one day there, and I kept watching the anim I kept watching the inclinator on the bulkhead. The bulkhead is the same as the wall, but the Navy always has its own uh, names for things of that, that type. But on the bulkhead was an inclinator which told, could tell you uh, how much of a roll the ship was taking. It was measured off in degrees, and of course the whole circle would be 360 degrees. But I kept watching that inclinator. We were in this fierce storm, and we were really rolling. And we went, we went past 30 degrees, we went to 32 degrees, 34 degrees, 36 degrees, 38 degrees, and I was beginning to get a little anxious. And I asked the, the officer of the deck, I said, how much can our ship take? And very matter-of-fact answer, he just said, well, when it gets to 45 degrees, she'll go on over. Well, I kept watching that inclinator, and pretty soon it began to back off down to 35, 32, and on down. And from then on, I never worried about our ship rolling over because I knew we could take it. We could take that typhoon. Well, in addition to those experiences, now we were heading to our home port for discharge, decommissioning process. Ships in the Navy had to go through a decommissioning experience after the end of the war and after we were no longer needed. That ship, our ship, went into the Puget Sound area in Washington State, Bremerton, and we began they began the process of decommissioning. Uh, I was uh, given the orders to proceed to Jacksonville, Florida, where I would be discharged. And I met with uh, about 40 other sailors. We were, we were given uh, meal tickets. I was given meal tickets. I have to explain that for some reason they put me in charge of this group of 40. And we uh, we headed to the depot, we boarded the train, and started home. It took about a week. This was a slow-moving train. Well, we took the northern route from the, the most northeasterly uh, area, northwesterly corner of our area, our country. We, we left there and went across the northern tier of the United States, went through that neck of Idaho, across Montana, the northern part of Montana. We went through the Dakotas on into Chicago where we had a layover of several hours. Uh, the sailors who were with me wanted to go in town and they, I gave them that opportunity because I, I knew everybody wanted to go home. They were anxious to get home. And I didn't think we would be le losing any of them in Chicago. And sure enough, they all made it back to our train car on time. <clears throat> but uh, I had to go into the Naval Regional Headquarters there in Chicago because we were running low on meal tickets for some reason. So that was an interesting experience for an 18-year-old sailor, almost 19 by that time. We boarded the train again and we headed south uh, to Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, one of the things that was uh, kind of a, a joke in a way, we came down south, and we even went through Opelika, Alabama, which was just a short distance from where I lived, my family was, in Lynette, Alabama, West Point, Lynette area. And we wanted to get off there. I wanted to, I didn't, I thought, well, it would be 
It would be good if they would just let me go home from here. But, of course, I couldn't do that. We had to go on to Jacksonville, Florida, where we were formally discharged. And as soon as we were discharged, then here comes this, uh, this Navy uh, recruiting officer who tried to talk us into enlisting. I don't think he succeeded much in getting enlistees at that point. We were all ready to go home and get on with the rest of our lives. Well, I enjoyed everything that I did uh, in my Navy experience. It was certainly a, a growth experience for me. I had joined the Navy for the duration of the war and was committed to, to seeing it through to successful completion. Um, in recent years, I've done a lot of research on the period during my service in the Navy. I know that had we not dropped the atomic bombs on Japan, that I would have been caught up in the invasion of Japan. Our president and our military leaders were planning for an invasion of Japan in November of 1945, and I would have been a part of that. Well, they had estimated, the military leaders had estimated, anywhere from 50,000 to 500,000 casualties if we had invaded Japan. It would have been a horrific battle, hand-to-hand -hand fighting by our uh, Army personnel, by our Marines. Kamikaze airplanes would have been crashing into our ships. So I'm glad that I could be a part of World War II, but I'm grateful that it was not necessary for me to be a part of the invasion of Japan. I want to again thank Paul Barnes for his uh, expertise in recording these uh, interviews, not only today, but all of them that we've been doing for the last four months. And I know on behalf of our Archives and History Committee, we all are grateful to Paul and thank him immeasurably for this service. Thank you so much. God bless you.